Hello there, and welcome to another of Andre's Artist Profiles. Uh, today, I am going to be profiling none other than da -da -da -da, John Coltrane. Uh, Coltrane uh, actually died uh, 46 years ago in 1967. But, you know, today would have been his birthday. So, uh, you know, I always do these on my birth his birthdays, of course. But I don't have every single thing Coltrane collected. Just rarities and stuff I really like because Coltrane was a man of very few words. But when he played, he literally seemed to speak to you through the way he played. I mean, he played really well and really uniquely. But he seemed to be speaking to you. You wanted to listen to when he, not when he played, but when he spoke through his horn. That's the way I always felt about Coltrane. He had that strong a connection to the soul of humanity. And they often say Coltrane spoke to people's souls. And I find that more common in a way in his earlier work than in his later work, where he almost seemed to be speaking in tongues and very abstractly. But anyway, this is, okay, this is um, two tenor sax players, uh, Frank West and John Coltrane. And this came out on Prestige in 1957, uh, September 20th, actually right around this time of year in 1957. And it says that this is a John Coltrane and Frank West album, John's name comes first, but I don't know if it was Democratic or one or the other, but you could say this is sort of Coltrane's debut, but on another hand, it's not exactly, but that's the earliest John Coltrane album I have. Not too long later, he released this. Now, this is acknowledged as his first official album as a leader. And actually, I'm sorry, this, this album you see right here came out after this one. So this was definitely his official album. Okay, that was probably a collaboration. This is definitely his first official album. And uh, it even says the number on here was different. I'm, a little gap there, I'm sorry. Now this album, in an interesting way, is a lot closer to John Coltrane's later work in the way that the themes he's picking out are not as overtly melodic. They're a bit more abstract. And you see that inclination coming out in Coltrane more. And as the songs get into themselves, he begins to speak, as they say at the time, more mainstream and more coherently but with always a lot of soul. Coltrane always played with a lot of soul. I mean, it wasn't soul music as you would categorize it on a billboard chart, but he definitely played with a soul. Now this is, you know, Blue Train. And you know, this is a classic album because by this time, the memorable themes and the spirited playing was really, you know, onto it. And he was signed from Prestige to Blue Note by this time. And this is his Blue Note debut, hence Blue Train. Uh, sadly, the reason he's covering his mouth is because his teeth rotted out because of heroin. A drug no one wants to use. I don't want to put a PSA out there. I don't use drugs, but <laughs> stay away from heroin. Bad stuff. I mean, I wonder if that's why Coltrane died as early as he was. It might have been other reasons, but anyway. Fantastic album. You know, it's got Lee Morgan, Philly Joe Jones, Paul Chambers, all the people Miles played with, you know. And he was with Miles at this point, so. Anyway, this album, he actually had a hit on the radio with a version of uh, My Favorite Things, The Sound of Music. A non-vocal version, but when you hear the way he improvised on sax on that song, you knew what his favorite things were. Wonderful album. A lot of standards on it from 1961. On Atlantic, by this point, Coltrane to Change Labels again. Another one of his classic albums. This was actually the first John Coltrane album I ever bought, called Olay. Now, I don't think it's one of his more famous albums, but it's a really nice record with McCoy Tyner, Freddie Hubbard, Reggie Workman, you know, Eric Dolphy, Alvin Jones, you know, all kinds of great people on it. Uh, I think it was made in 1961 or two. He was starting to get a little more abstract on this album, but he still had that extremely soulful quality. The Africa Brass Sessions. This really showcases Coltrane playing in a somewhat different way. You know, we, he was becoming more influenced by the music of the East. And, uh, of course, as implied, 
you know, certain African ideas, and, and things were changing over for Coltrane. And then, of course, there's the John Coltrane album I think we all know very well, A Love Supreme. This is not really a collection of songs. It's, as they described it on Ken Burns' jazz, it is, in all essentials, a three-part devotional suite consisting of acknowledgement, resolution, and pursuance, and psalm, part four, part four-part devotional suite. And it doesn't have a lyric except John chanting in a very... Um, Tibetan kind of way, A Love Supreme, the title over and over again on the end of the album. It's like a mantra. This album is definitely a mantra and a beautiful piece of work. May even go beyond jazz. I never tire of listening to A Love Supreme. I think every jazz fan might probably agree with me. Anyway, that's my collection of music by John Coltrane. This guy, I could sit here doing a podcast for an hour talking about how wonderful this guy is to me musically, but, you know, I could just have a whole shelf of John Coltrane stuff because he's such an amazing artist. But anyway, that's what I've got. And uh, happy belated birthday to John Coltrane and uh, my best to all his surviving family. See you next time.